a young Danish girl seduces everything in sight after daddy refuses her naughty commands. She will have an affair with her teacher, pretend that her teenage boyfriend is dear old dad and finally get to her stepmother. Safti's teenage temptress Kaja enthusiastically embark upon a lusty series of sensually mounted adventures. In the no less salubrious local of her sublime looking Copenhagen, her questionable motivation for all this zesty satinalia being due to her father's stoic rejection of Kaza's playful and somewhat inappropriately erotic advances. Saucy greenhouse god Joseph Sarno was certainly no slouch when it came to sprightly exquisitely stylish, ever so daring, 60s, 70s smart, having sought the audaciously steamy, sinfully sensational flesh fist, Inga starring the luridly luscious Jess Franco's muse Mari Lil Zida. Daddy Darling isn't quite so much a coming of age drama as coming quite often mama and therefore taking into consideration the notably new bile dimension of master eroticist Joseph Sarno's vivacious and frequently clothed starlet Helly Lewis. One can readily appreciate why our canny exploitation horse took this more poorant approach. While Daddy Darling isn't exactly fine art, perhaps even being a trifle undignified to some. This careless sapphic 70s sojourn is a far from unsightly celluloid confection. So eager fan of both Mr. Sarno's orgiastic aura and the delectably voluptuous topography of Halle Lewis are sure to be sweetly seduced by this illicitly enticing trip into the delirious diorama of ingratiatingly Epicurean Sopko Eurosleaze captured by a laudably raunchy slap and tickle slides of some considerable repute. That is to say, a few things jump right out about this entry in the Sarnevos. The salacious content promised both by the title and the tag used to market it. This is Kacha. She is 19. She is untouched. She thinks it's time she did something about it. Simply doesn't exist in the movie. At least not as advertised. Though the subject of daughter Kaza being romantically obsessed with single father Eric does drive at least half of the plot. Any licharious coupling between the two exists in the film instead as a mostly platonic, mostly tame affection. Kaza does have one looser dream wherein she imagine making love to her father, one of the film's few true exploitation set pieces. But it sought all chiaroscuro and with what is clearly a younger, fitter, handsomer body double standing in for her absent dad. There is some nude modeling, some muddy foreplay, the usual under the covers gyrating as well as Kaja's first love experience, which is sought mostly via the expression on her face and accompanying dialogue. Those expecting the parade of flesh in Sarno's later 70s effort, though Abigail Leslie is back in town, or confession of a young American housewife, or Laura's toys, will come always disappointed as Daddy Darling is decidedly tame in comparison. What won't be disappointing is the usual caliber, the breadth and depth of Sarno's writing. Fully realized character arcs sought through with sadness and melodrama. Multiple love triangles that regularly morph and swept their corners. The highest high and the most unbearable lows and the recurring suspicion that when it comes to the human condition there is no cure. Because of this it would make for a great double bill 
with Chris Warfield's similarly mistitled Teenage Seductress. Like Daddy Darling, Warfield's film takes a taboo and sleazy premise. Trumpeted in exactly those terms by 20-something Sondra Curry's delivery of the line, I'm gonna love you father just like you love me. But execute it with melodramatic and psychological depth instead of on-screen sleaze and flesh. Both Sarno and Warfare craft a movie more interested in psychological and spiritual wound, in the rituals and relationship and expectation ingrained in us by growing up in society. And what happens when we feel those expectations, the fulfillment in our own lives of relationship goals, get banned instead? Warfield's potential incest plot comes from the daughter being abandoned, spun, voided out by the father. Her love desire has been deformed and misdirected because of the decade of her father refusing to be her father. Sarno's father here is the opposite, active and present in his daughter's life. A single dad forced to provide for and raise their daughter after the untimely demise of mom. Even though business trip take him away for extended period of time, he is perhaps too present in the daughter's worldview. Interestingly enough, both scenario result in a romance that is as angry as it is insistent, with the love act being pointed like a weapon at each family unit. There is a lot here, cinematically speaking, that doesn't feel like Sarno. Stylistic flourishes, repeated montage sequences, a very on the nose use of more 60s sounding pop, etc. The cumulative effect is that probably a full third of the movie feels like it was shot by someone other than Sarno. Both Sarno and the film's producer Ken Collins confirmed this in the interview included on the disc. In fact, according to Collins, he cut the film, directed all the English dubbing, and even handled some of the scoring with no input from Sarno. In the liner note, Sarno biographer Michael Bowen put it this way, Connoisseurs of the Sarno aesthetic, however, will recognize that Daddy Darling frequently diverged from the director's traditional editorial style. A few conspicuous montage sequence and the occasional use of superimposition and slow motion believe the fact that Sarno was many miles away during the time when the film was finding its final form. Say all that to say, ranking wise, it's not near the top for me in the Sarnovas. I'm not penning it as there is always something compelling somewhere in Sarno. And his pet theme and compulsion always find their way to the surface, no matter the influence of outside producers. But for me, it can't exist in the same stratosphere as his sublime collaboration with Mary Mandam and crew in the 70s, or the different but equally sublime stratosphere of his gorgeous black and white film with Maria Liz in the 60s. A whole book could be written about Sarno's obsession with medallion, jewelry, sparkly totem and how they are coded, use, prop in his movies to be the seat of female power. The first time I saw it was in the earliest Sarno I've seen, 1960s Sinew Sinners. There an aging ballet queen clings mightily to what she claims is a voodoo charm, a massive gold medallion that hangs like an anchor around her neck, and yet wield its cedars, using its power to wrench on the power dynamic of an already f up love triangle, the one between her, her cap daughter and the latest unemployed good-for-nothing check of no trade boy toy who is become attached to mass gyrating hip. The power of the medallion there is palpable. It reminded me of the exotic other fetish object in something like the Hammer House of Horrors episode Charlie Boy. 
द मॉडर्न डे सिविलाइज कैरेक्टर एट फर्स्ट स्कॉफ एट द पॉसिबिलिटी दैट एनी सच थिंग कुड एग्जिस्ट फॉर द स्कॉफ एट द थॉट दैट सच अ थिंग कुड होल्ड एनी स्वे ओवर देयर लाइव अंटिल इट डज एंड देन लर्ल्ड एज दे आर इन टू अ कम्प्लीट इन एबिलिटी टू फैंड फॉर दैम सेल्फ बिकॉज दे हैव बीन सिविलाइज डिफाइन दैम सेल्फ इन कैपेबल ऑफ कॉपिंग विद द इम्प्लीकेशन ऑफ सच अ थिंग it also saw up even more overtly in vampire ecstasy where it is latched around the neck of a many time removed descendant of a vampire witch the baroness born at the stake hundred of years ago but still somehow lurking around the castle in the ether lurking and ready to awake it is used there to conjure the dead essence of the born witch to reincarnate her hallelujah remind me an awful lot of Eva Orlin and Gio Petre who played the darling's actual love interest remind me an awful lot of the actress who played the scheming maid in Argento's Four Flies the love machination of the spun daughter single father and single father's new love interest remind me of any number of italian jali the two that come immediately to mind are both by Silvio Amedio 1972's Smile Before Death and 1975 So Young So Lovely So Vicious all share a similar cat and mouse dynamic whose stake gets steadily raised as the film progresses regardless of the other editorial influence on the film Sarno here nailed the ending Casa existing suddenly in the wake of her tryst with her stepmother unable to contact her absent father spun by the female painter who promised her another life comes out the front door of her father's house full of luggage and traveling cloth punctuated by a sad song soundtrack it's a sort that could so easily be cliche but per usual it's sarno's ability to choose and work with actor that give if that particular reason that just knock you the viewer out the camera goes close up on kaja and we see the whole film play through as emotion on her face resistant but assertive painted out strident as said as said can be but also assured in the decision she is made as sarno say in the interview helly louis knew her lines completely she knew the poses i wanted and she felt them she is 19 she has never been touched but of course by the time this movie is over she is definitely going to be touched a lot this movie about a young girl who yearns for her own widow father may seem pretty sleazy to those uninitiated to 70s euro exploitation films keep in mind though that if this had been italian exploitation film of that era the girl definitely would have had love with her father same if it had been a french art film of the time except the character would have been about 14 so the sleaziness is all pretty relative but while this is considerably less sordid than it appear on paper i don't know that i quite buy it as a sensitive coming of age story it's definitely pretty exploitative the girl certainly has fantasy love with her father at least and after he rebuff her in real life she move on to a lot of other people like her best friend's boyfriend nor are many of this encounter terribly realistic or believable she has a three way at one point with a female painter and a nude model for instance and for the peace the resistance she decide to seduce her father's new wife this jealous daughter seducing her stepmother to be plot was also used in the later gloria guida vehicle peccati di juant which make for at least two more time than something like this has probably ever happened in real life like most jo sarno movie this visually looks very good at least and the acting is well above average for soft film 
Sarno always had a very good eye for Scandinavian lovelies like Christina Lindbergh, Mari Liljedal, and Mari Fossa. The lead here, Haley Lewis, is not quite of the same caliber as those three, but it kind of worked in this movie to have a more average looking girl. She certainly does have the stuff for so film though. Like Christina Lindbergh, she has the combination of a slender, girlish body and very ample body that is very rarely found in nature. Unlike most of today's plastic surgery disaster though, she was good enough actress to at least convincingly play a virgin. This isn't the best Sarno film, but it's certainly worth a gander.